Take your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, four verses this morning, 3 through 6. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. This is now the word of God. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning because you are our God. And Father, we come to exalt and to praise you. This is a service of worship. We gather here to sing. We gather here to extol your name. We gather here to ponder your truth that we might know you better and worship you more. God, I thank you even for the song Peggy and Leo sang in this mind's eye picture of the day that you come and you reign upon this earth and we see you seated seated on your throne, your glory filling the earth. Lord Jesus, we want that day. We long for that day. We long to see you glorified as you deserve to be glorified. We long to see every creature bowing in submission to you declaring your name as Lord, honoring and worshiping you forever. We long for that. We thank you, God, that even though we live in a wicked world, in a world that spurns your name and does not honor you as God or give thanks, we thank you, God, for moments like this, this Lord's Day, where we can gather with your people, and for just a moment, we can catch a glimpse and get a picture of what it means to be in one accord with loud voice, singing and praising and exalting your name. We thank you for this reprieve. We thank you for these moments when we gather and do this. We thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for the clarity with which it speaks. I thank you for the truth with which it convicts, the way that it opens my heart and shows me what I am. Lord God, I thank you for that. And it's my prayer this morning that as we open your word, that your spirit would make your truth clear. You're the only one that can open blind eyes. You're the only one that can open deaf ears. You're the only one that can give life to a dead soul. You're the only one that can teach your truth. And so we lean upon you, we trust in you, and we ask for you, God, to speak, that you might bring glory to your name through the way that you transform and sanctify and even redeem us. God, we love you and praise you. We thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Well, this morning we're coming back to our study of 1 John. It's been a couple of weeks, a few actually, I know. But you remember now, as we get back into 1 John, that John has been on theme, really the first eight or nine verses, really ten verses, eleven maybe, in the book of John seem to me, depends on how you want to break it down and outline it, but it seems to me a bit of the introduction. And which John sort of lays out for us how he's introducing and what the truth he wants you to understand. And thus far, it's all been about the issue of fellowship. Not fellowship in the sense of how we get along and how we shake hands and if we like each other and things of that nature, but the real genuine reality of spiritual fellowship. That's what the church is. It is a fellowship. We are those who share common life. We are those who have been redeemed from sin, transferred from darkness into a kingdom of light. We are those who have been forgiven, redeemed, and therefore have fellowship with God. Even though we have differences, different desires, different activities, different gifts and abilities, we come at things differently, different upbringing, different genetics, you you get it all. We're different in so many ways. But the one thing that all believers share in common is that we have been redeemed from our sin into fellowship with God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's our common bond. That is our fellowship. And John laid that out for us in chapter 1 and really even the first two verses of chapter 2. And he taught us that the fellowship is genuinely this. Those who believe in the true Jesus, not some made-up phony one, but the one who was God and became flesh, who died upon a cross, those who believe in that Christ, we are not those who deny that we are sinful or deny that we have a sin nature. We are those who have come to grips with the reality of what we are. We are fallen, 
sinful, wretched people, but we are those who in repentance and humility have come to confess that sin to the Father, to repent of that sin, find forgiveness in Jesus, who now walk in light and not in darkness. That's a great way to describe the church. Of all the ways that the church gets defined, whether denominationally, you know, your Baptist, Methodist, Church of Christ, whatever it may be, of all the liturgical rules and practices of this church is very orthodox and liturgical, this one is free and come as you are, and all of that kind of stuff and ways that churches get defined, at its core, the church is simply this, those who have repented of their sin, placed their faith in the Jesus of the Bible, and through his atoning work have been sanctified, forgiven, justified and transferred from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light so that we can now have fellowship with the God who is light. That's what we are in the church. John laid that out. So much so that if you don't believe in Christ, you're not part of the church. If you've not repented of your sin, you are not part of the church. If you walk in darkness, John said, you don't have fellowship with God. If you say that you're not sinful... You're lying to yourself, John said. You don't know the truth. And if you say that you've not sinned and you don't sin, then you're calling God a liar because God has very much clearly said, no, you do, and you have, and you need to be forgiven. None of those people are in the church. And that's just basic Christianity 101, we've said. But there's a reason that John is drawing that line in the sand. There's a reason John sort of came out of the gate swinging to point out what is the church and what is not. There's actually two. Because on one hand... John wants to deal with those who are deceived. You saw that up in chapter 1. In verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. I mean, your own heart has lied to you. You're believing the lies of the enemy. You're believing the lies of your own heart. You're deceived. And as such a state, you're in a state of false assurance. There are many people in the world who think they are saved and they are not saved. Who think they are members of the church and they are not members of the church. It may be on the paper somewhere. But they're not in fellowship with God. I tell you that I was one of those for 11 years. I've told you this. I did everything I was supposed to do as a kid. I didn't know Jesus. I was not saved. I was still in never much a sin as I ever was. In the heart and concealed so that you couldn't see it. But God saw it. And there was no fellowship with God. That was me. Deceived. Thinking I was saved. But not. And so on one hand, John draws this line in the sand. Because it's a great act of compassion and mercy. If he might expose us. If he might simply say, you need to see this. I'm so thankful he exposed me. I'm thankful he showed me I was fake. I'm thankful he showed me I was a fraud. John writes for that purpose. But there's another purpose that John writes, and that is that for those who are genuinely redeemed, he wants you to know it. He wants you to know it. He wants you to enjoy the reality of knowing that you are saved, that you are in the fellowship, that you have an eternal hope, secure, and that when you die, you will go to heaven John wants you to have what we call assurance. We sing a song about it. We call it blessed assurance. That may be the main reason John wrote. In fact, at the end of the book, in 1 John 5, 13, John writes, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's what I want you to know. I want you to have assurance. You see it twice in our text this morning. Look at verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know him. Verse 5, very end of the verse. By this we know that we are in him. That's the goal, to know. Other times in the book, 1 John three nineteen, he writes, we will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him. In 1 John three twenty four, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he's given us. 1 John four thirteen, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his Spirit. In fact, John uses that word know some 40 times in this letter. It's all about assurance. So if you're not saved, but under some delusion that you are, John wants you to know that. It would be a horrible thing to die thinking you were saved and not be. But if you are saved, John also wants you to know that because he wants you to have assurance. And let's think about that for a second. I don't know if you spent much time thinking about the reality of assurance. I think assurance is one of the greatest mercies and compassions of God that we experience on a daily basis. It actually blows my mind that God gives it. This is one of those areas in which you know, we read in Isaiah that my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are not your ways. This is one of those areas in which the thought processes and ways of God do not align with the thought processes and ways of humanity. Because humanity has never come to the conclusion that assurance is a good way to get productivity out of people. 
Think about it. I remember being in college. We always had those professors that we didn't like, some just because they were hard. But we had those others that we didn't think were very good professors. And nearly to a T, one of the professors that you'd have that wouldn't be very good, that didn't try very hard, that didn't teach much, just sort of went off on his own bandwagon, they would say, yeah, but he's tenured. He's tenured, and so he gets to keep his job forever. They can't fire him. They can't lose him. And I remember in college thinking, well, that's about the dumbest thing I ever heard, right? That you would tell this guy, no matter what, You've got a job. Say whatever you want. Do whatever you want. We don't care. You've got a job at our university. And my thought process was, you're just begging him to be a lousy professor because you've ripped that fear, right, of punishment or losing your job out from under him. You think athletic ability and coaches. Do coaches ever want to go to a player and say, no matter what you do or how bad you play, you will always be a starter on this team? No coach does that, do they? They constantly want you looking over your shoulder. If you don't perform, if you don't do well, that guy behind you will take your job. I'll set you on the bench and they'll get to play. And it's sort of that fear factor of competition that keeps you motivated. Even in religion, you've seen it. Man-made religion is love to use that reality of, quote, losing salvation, which is not true. But that reality that you can lose it. So what is that? That's a fear thing to put a thumb on you and say, you'd better perform. Because if you don't perform... We yank it right out from under you and, you know, you'll be toast. You'll be lost. You'll be, you'll be under the wrath of God again. Religion loves to use that. Why do, why do men do that? Because we've said, if you give somebody assurance, you're going to produce apathy. You're going to produce laziness. You're going to produce disobedience. You're going to make terrible people. So the worst thing that you could do is tell people you're mine no matter what. That, that, that seems like the worst reality ever. And yet God... Holding this card in his hand freely gives it up and says, not only will I save you and save you forever, but I want to make sure you know it. I want you to have assurance. Does it surprise you even to know that one of the roles of the Holy Spirit whom God gives you is to give you assurance? Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. What a tremendous function of the Holy Spirit to tell you You are God's child. What a wonderful thing. The Bible even commands, by the way, that you and I pursue assurance. In 2 Peter 1.10, Peter says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. That is, I want you to do all the work necessary to know that you know that you know that you've been saved. That's what he says. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Peter said, you ought to go after that, believer. You ought to pursue The knowledge of your salvation. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 13. He says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? That's Paul again saying, you need to pursue this assurance. You need to know. You need to know if you are, in fact, a child of God. That ought to be a test you run on yourself. Um, you ought to, people go to the doctor for all sorts of tests to find out how they're doing here, how they're doing here, how they're doing here. Marcella's made me check my blood pressure every day for the last two weeks, right? To find out if I'm going to die this afternoon or not. That's the only reason I can think that I do it, right? To find out what I don't know about myself. And the world genuinely agrees that's a good thing to know. You should know your blood pressure. You should know blood sugar. And I don't know other things that I probably should know and do not know. But I know this, you had better know if you're saved or not. I mean, of all the things that you will run a test on to figure out if it's reality in your life, I can't think of a bigger one than that. You ought to pursue assurance. Now, do not confuse assurance with security. Don't confuse the two. They're not the same thing. What we call eternal security, what Baptists for years have called once saved, always saved. It's not a good name, but it is true. Or maybe better yet, the preservation of the saints would be a a better term. What we call always saved, you can't lose your salvation, is true. I'm not going to spend a long time debating that this morning. That's for another sermon. But if you don't believe it, go read Romans 5, Romans 8, and Hebrews 7. If you can come away from those three chapters thinking you can lose your salvation, then read them again. You don't know how to read the Bible. Because that's all that they're about. It's all about the security of the believer. We have a sovereign God who chose to save you when he knew you were a thug. And so it's not about your thugginess that you lose it. He knew what you were when he saved you. We have a God who predetermined to justify you by sending his son. And if he would be willing to send his son, Paul asked in Romans 8, do you really think he's going to yank anything else from you? Beyond that, we have a savior who died upon the cross, rose from the dead, interceded to the right hand of the father. And his sole purpose this day is to intercede on your behalf. That's what we sing in the hymn uh, before the throne of God above. 
I have this constant plea. I have one who intercedes for me continually. That's all about your security. The Bible says we have a Holy Spirit who seals us for the day of redemption. It's all about security. How many times do you hear Jesus promise that if you believe, you get eternal life? I mean, think that for a second. When did he ever say you get temporary life or potential life? He didn't. He offered eternal life, life that never ends. Not possible life, but eternal. He said of his own, they will never perish. He said, I will raise them up on the last day. He said, no one can snatch them out of my hand. That's security of the believer. It's all throughout the Bible. Those who tell you you are not secure are simply trying to manipulate you into doing what they want you to do because they figured out that fear and lack of assurance is a great motivator. But it's not true. The Bible says those who are saved are saved and saved forever. True. That's security. Now, the tragedy is that you can be secure and not know it. What an awful feeling is that? You ever been in a moment in life when you perceived that you might be in danger? You weren't really in danger, but you thought you were? Well, that's not a fun place to be. That's not an enjoyable way to live. If you are secure, joy says you should know it. If you are saved and will be saved, you should know it. You want to know what assurance really is? Assurance is basically the ability to enjoy your salvation. That's what assurance is. The ability to enjoy your salvation. That's assurance. It is the peace that surpasses all comprehension. It is the fullness of joy that Jesus talks about. It is the rest that the preacher in Hebrews offered. It's all about the worship and gratitude that we can bring to God because we know that he has saved us in spite of what we are. If you want some pictures of assurance, here's a few in the Bible I think are very fitting. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What is that? That's assurance, isn't it? Even though I go through death, I'm not afraid. How do you go through death and not be afraid? Assurance. Acts 18. Listen to Paul. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. That's when he was in Corinth. And what a great promise to get from God when you show up somewhere. Go ahead and preach. I'm not going to let them touch you. That's assurance, isn't it? Later, when Paul's on a ship, it's about to be shipwrecked in Acts 27, It says, when they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I've been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. That's assurance, isn't it? You're fine, Paul. You're going to make it. Well, that's good news. We like that sort of assurance to say, I'm okay, I'm fine. That's what John wants you to have. Now, there is also something known as false assurance. That's someone that seeks to enjoy the benefits of salvation they don't possess. (laughs) They've deluded themselves. They've lied to themselves. They've convinced themselves they're saved when, in fact, they are not. And John most certainly would expose them. But equally drastic, equally regrettable, is when you can have a true believer who has been forgiven by the Lord, who has been saved, and yet cannot wrap their mind around that reality. You are supposed to know if you're a child of God. You are supposed to have assurance if you're a child of God. This is not something you're supposed to wake up every morning of the day and just hope that he's still going to save you. That's a horrible way to live, and it is not God's intention for your life. John wants you to have assurance. So the question of the morning, how do I get it? How do I get assurance? I would like that peace. I would like to have that rest. I would like to know that I know that I know that I'm saved. Well, that, that would just do it for me, preacher. I would like to know that. How can I know If I have fellowship with God, how can I know if I'm in the light? Well, like anything else, if it's something you can test for, as Paul said, if it's something you should seek to make certain, as Peter said, then it seems to be that there must be some sort of criteria by which it's validated, right? I mean, otherwise, if if they're just saying, well, you should go after assurance, but I really don't know how to tell you to get it. Well, that doesn't help. 
If they're telling you, test yourself, well, test what? What's the criteria? How do I validate this? What am I looking for? I mean, what chemicals am I mixing together to try to figure out if, in fact, I've been saved? What is this criteria? John's going to let you know. Obedience. Obedience. Obedience is the criteria by which we measure genuine salvation. And by obedience, I don't mean a one-time obeying. I don't even mean maybe a habit of obeying certain commands. I'm talking about a heart that beats for obedience. I'm talking about a heart that says, what I want today and what I want tomorrow and what I want for the rest of my life is to obey God. That's what I want. That's what drives me. That's my sole ambition. That's my goal. That's my desire. This is the criteria by which John measures your life, my life, by which John will determine if you are saved, if you are not saved, if you have false assurance, or if you should have real assurance. Obedience is the pathway to assurance, and that's what John's going to show us this morning. Now, we're going to work through verses 3 through 6, not necessarily in order. We're going to kind of push around on them a little bit. But I'm going to prove to you and show you why your obedience or your desire for obedience is the sole and chief criteria as to whether or not you're saved and whether or not you can know it. So let's work our way through this. I'm going to give you, I think, five points, but each one builds on the next. But here's the first one you need to see. Obedience proves salvation. Okay? Obedience proves salvation. Now, first, look at these verses. We're just going to take a bird's eye view at them. I just kind of want you to see in general what he's saying. By this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we're in him. The one he says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Now, at their core, there, there's certainly some differences in each of those verses. But at their core, John tells you basically the same thing four times. I mean, it all stands on the same foundation, doesn't it? You know if a person is saved or not by examining their obedience. I mean, he says it four times, a little bit different ways, with a little bit different nuance. Now, he's very direct. We've said this. And I appreciate John being direct. That's what allows us to be direct. But here's the simple point. Are you ready? You may or may not like it. If you are not obedient to the commands of God, you are not saved. If you're not obedient to the commands of God, you're not saved. I was baptized. I went to church, put some money. If you're not obedient to the commands of God... You are not saved. This is a simple point. Obedience proves salvation. Listen to Jesus on this. John 8, 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him. Now what is that? Those are people that claim to believe in Jesus. That's what they are. He's been preaching in the temple, and a whole group of people raised their hand, walked the aisle, not really, but you understand what I mean, and said, we believe. Notice how he responds. If you continue in my word, what's that? That's called obedience. Then you are... Truly disciples of mine. And you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Well, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? You can claim to believe, Jesus says. But we're going to know if you're mine by whether or not you continue. I mean, it's, it's a simple test. Listen to John the Baptist. This is a very important verse on this subject. John 3.36. John says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Now, boy, that's... That's evangelicalism from the heart, right? We've all known that. Well, you believe in Jesus, you get life. We've said it for years. Believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. But notice what John keeps saying. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, John did something kind of tricky and sneaky there. Do you notice how he swapped words? We would expect John to say, if you believe in the Son, you have eternal life. But if you don't believe in the Son, you won't see life. But he doesn't do that, does he? John uses two words interchangeably. Do you see that? If you believe, you get life. But if you don't what? If you don't obey, you're not going to get life. In fact, you remain under the wrath of God. Why would John interchange the word believe and obey? It's because the two are linked. 
No obedience means no belief. No belief, no obedience. They work together. Listen to James, James 2.14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone, keyword, says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? And the answer there is obviously no. I mean, you can say you believe all day long. We live in a culture where people can say anything, right? You can identify as a Christian if you want to, but that don't make it so. You understand what we're saying? You can say it. Does it make it real? James 2.17, James says, Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Martin Luther used to say that we are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. If the faith that you have does not produce works in your life, then I don't know what you have, but it's not called faith. You've got some imposter, generic, off-brand, Walmart, best choice faith that does not save, but not saving faith. Obedience proves salvation. Now that's the premise John bases this whole passage on. He, he, he's building on this the whole time. And you say, well, John, how can you say that? How can you say so definitively that obedience proves salvation? Well, there's a reason. In fact, there's two, but here's the first one. Obedience demonstrates love. This is what we're building on. How can you say that obedience proves salvation? Because obedience demonstrates love. Look at verse 5. But whoever keeps his word, there's obedience, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. Now love of God does not mean God's love for you. You'd be better off to read that love for God. That's what he's talking about. The love for God has been perfected in your life, and we know that when you keep his word, when you obey him. Now, here we run right up against obvious Christianity. If I ask you again, what is the greatest, the biggest, the most important, the chief, pinnacle, end-all command of the Bible, what is it? Love the Lord your God. Right? Isn't that it? I mean, that's the goal, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Jesus said, that's the big one. Love God. Every command in the Old Testament was driving to this point, love God. That's what they're all about. Every sin in the Bible was a detriment and a testimony that you don't love God the way you should. Sin is when you find satisfaction in something other than God. That's what it is. The great command is to love God. Now, if you talk about the mission of the church... When we go out into the world, what are we trying to produce in people? Listen to Paul in 1 Timothy 1. But the goal of our instruction is what? Love. From a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And love there is not love for people, although that pours out of a love for God. The love there is for God. Paul said we are trying to produce a love for God in people. A pure love, a real one, a good conscience, meaning there's no doubt. And a sincere faith, it's real. It's not a difficult point to make that the calling of Christianity is to call men back to love God. That's what we're calling for. In fact, there's a clear distinction between believers and non-believers in the world. It's real easy to see. Believers love God. Non-believers don't. It's not hard. It's a difference. But there's more to the question to be asked. How do you discern the genuineness of a person's love. How do you know that? When somebody says, and they throw it out all the time today, I love you, right? That's an easy word to say. It's an easy word to write, or the generic text one, love ya, right? Whatever. We throw it out there really, how do you know if it's real? How do you measure love? How do you know if love is real? Now, in your life, you may have messed it up and bunged it up many, many times, but let's say you got a daughter or a son, and they bring home a knucklehead, right? It's probably happened to some of y'all before. They bring home a knucklehead, and they say, but I love him, Daddy, right? You look at him and say, Daddy, he loves me. How do you discern whether or not the love that this boy claims to have for your daughter is genuine love? Or is he just after something, right? How do you know, Dad? Do you measure it? Do you discern it? Or you say, oh, well, if he says he loves you, then I guess he does. Is that what you do? No, you know better than that, right? Love is verifiable. Love is measurable. There's a way to tell if it's real. What is love? Love is when you sacrifice self for the good of another, right? Love is an action. It always has been. Lust is when you sacrifice the other for the good of yourself. 
But love is when you say, I will put my desires, my wills, my comforts, my treasures, my whatever it is, I'm going to put that on the back burner, maybe even lose it, for you. That's love. That, that's when you see love played out. It's not emotional. It's not soap opera-y. It's not flingy and, you know, Bambi's Twitter painted and all that kind of stuff with little hearts floating around. That's not love. That, that's just some sort of chemical passion that shows up in your brain. Love is when you consciously, actively set aside your best interest for the good of another. Now, listen to Jesus. John fourteen fifteen. if you want to know. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Actually, I skipped ahead, Chris. Go back to John 13, 1. Chris, shoot me when I do this. John 13, 1. Here's Jesus. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That word is to the max, to the uttermost. Here's Jesus, knowing he's about to die, and the Bible says he loved them completely, fully, perfectly. Well, how do you know? Because he said he did. How do you know? John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this. That one laid down his life for his friends. How do you know Jesus loves? Because of what he did on the cross, right? I mean, Paul even said God demonstrated his love for us. Then when we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's measurable. There's an action. Now we go back. Listen to Jesus in the upper room, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I mean, that's not a threat. That's just reality. That's just the way it is. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. John 14, 30. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. I mean, this isn't rocket science. It's pretty clear. And so John says... Whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. And where do you think John got that? Right out of the upper room. It's real easy to see. This is why we say that obedience proves salvation, because obedience proves you love God. If you say you love God, but you do not obey him, you have no leg to stand on at all. Very simple. But that's not the only reason obedience proves salvation. There's another reason obedience proves salvation. This is the third point. Obedience demonstrates transformation. Obedience demonstrates transformation. Look at the end of verse 5 and verse 6. John says, By this we know that we are in Him. We use that word in Him a lot, don't we? That's how we know we're in Him. The one who says he abides in Him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. That is to say, the man who claims to be saved, the man who claims to be in Christ, ought to no longer walk like he used to walk, but ought to now walk like Jesus walked. You're aware that salvation is about new life, right? I mean, when he saves us, he saves us from sin. If you're still in your sin, you obviously didn't get saved from it. Salvation is about leaving the kingdom of darkness and entering the kingdom of light. Salvation is about becoming a new creation. Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. I mean, that, that's just general, basic Christianity 101. You're not the same anymore. When he saves you, you're different. Well, how do you tell? When you look at your life, what is the chief criteria by why you measured if your salvation was real or not? You look back and say, am I different? Don't you? Can you see that you are? I mean, that, that's what haunted me. I got baptized today, but for 11 years, I couldn't tell any difference in me. I, I still wanted the same things I always wanted. There wasn't any transformation. Oh, I, could, I could act right to keep up my reputation. I, I could act right to you know, try to pull the wool over your eyes, but there wasn't anything different. And then at 19, I've shared this with you, that's when I gave my heart to Christ, only I didn't do it the Baptist way. I didn't walk an aisle. I didn't come pray a prayer. I didn't fill out a card. I didn't really know what happened to me. Except, I was not the same. I was so different. It's like there was somebody zipped out of my skin and somebody else moved in. It was different. I didn't want the same things I used to want. I, and I'm not saying I did something. Just all of a sudden, I am not the same person I used to be. 
Because I never really got taught much about regeneration or salvation changing your life. It took me a few years before I even knew what happened. Then you realize you got saved. That's what happened. He transformed you. He changed you. When you're in him, you ought to be different. He says you ought to walk like Jesus walked. So let me ask you a question. How did Jesus walk? Would you say that Jesus walked obediently or disobediently? You get it, right? I mean, we've done whole studies on what we call the active obedience of Jesus, which was his commitment to obey every aspect of the law. And we've talked about the passive obedience of Jesus, which was his willingness to submit to the commands of God, even the cross. And we talk about how Jesus never failed, never once. You do understand then that Jesus never leads somebody into disobedience. Do you understand that? Jesus will never guide you into sin. And so John simply says, you ought to be walking like he walked. John 8, 29. He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Jesus said, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. It's a life of obedience. Steve Lawson said, assurance comes from seeing your changed life. That's how you know you've been saved. Because he changed you. Obedience proves transformation. Obedience demonstrates that the Spirit of God has moved in and has changed you. That's what's different about your life after salvation. Before, a rebel and an enemy. Afterward, a slave and a son. Obeying. It's the difference. This is so clear. Throughout the Bible, listen to Galatians 5. You know this. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, Outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't know how it gets any clearer than that. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Do you see the night and day difference? And then Paul says, now... Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those who got saved killed the old man and put on the new man. Obvious. 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? I mean, John's been saying that, hadn't he? There is no fellowship between light and darkness. This ought to be obvious. Do not be deceived, he said. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, there it is again. And then Paul says, look, such were some of you. I won't make you raise your hand, but I'm on that list. I was some of those people. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. What happened? He changed you. And then what happened? He saved you. He cleansed you. Listen to Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared. What does the grace of God do in a person's life, I wonder? It brings salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Salvation is marked by the redemption from lawless deeds. Again, this isn't, this isn't rocket science. This isn't deep Christianity. This is basic 101. When I ask you, are you saved? And you say, yes, I'm saved. And I say, how do you know that you're saved? Let me tell you what the answer is not. The answer is not, well, because I think I am. Well, I got baptized. Well, I go to church. Well, I walked an aisle one time. I prayed a prayer. I remember back when. If I were to ask you this morning, are you alive? How many of you are going to pull out your birth certificate? Well, it says here, right? Yeah, must be. You don't pull out your birth certificate to see if you're alive. Then why in the world would you tell me about some time when you were baptized when you were seven as to say you know you're saved? How do you know you're alive? Right? You can feel it. 
thump, 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 right? You check your vitals. You check the criteria. Not was I alive yesterday. How do I know if I'm alive today, right now, and what's the answer? Obedience. Obedience. Are you different? None of those other things really prove anything, except at best, maybe you were coerced or manipulated at one point in your life. Obedience proves that you were saved. And let me add to this. When we talk about obedience proving your salvation, we mean this, immediate obedience. There used to be this common jargon, it's so backward and wrong, that you could somehow accept Jesus as your Savior at one point and then make him Lord later, which is not biblical. It's so wrong, it's not even funny. Listen, when you got saved, obedience happens immediately. Now, I'm not saying perfect obedience. Obviously, we still mess up, or else John wouldn't say that the mark of a Christian is that they confess their sin when they sin. I'm not saying that we perfectly obey all the time. Nobody does that. We mess up. But what I am saying is that from the moment you got saved, you know what became the passion of your life? Obedience. It happened that moment. That moment, your heart began to beat that you might obey. It was immediate. It doesn't happen 15 years down the road where you say, well, you know, I am saved. The obedience part just hasn't kicked in yet. (laughs) Then you're not saved. It's willing obedience would be another aspect. The heart has been changed. The whole basis of the new covenant is that I will take my law and do what with it? Write it on your heart. I will cause them to obey my commandments, he said in the new covenant. You don't have to tell a believer, obey, and they go, I don't want to obey. That doesn't mean there's never a battle. There is. We still have the flesh. You get it and I get it. But, But no believer wakes up in the morning and says, I sure hope I don't have to obey God today. No believer wakes up and says, oh, I hope God doesn't have anything for me to do. Right? That's not the heartbeat of a believer. It's willing obedience. I'll tell you something else. It's lasting obedience. We don't retire where we say, I've obeyed God for 20 years. Now I get to go do what I want. Right? I, I, get, I, can, I, think, I think it's somebody else's turn to obey God. That's not a believer. The heartbeat of the believer is to obey God all the time, every day. That, that's your lifeblood. That's your joy. That's your desire. A true believer loves God. A true believer has been transformed by God. And that's why a true believer obeys God and wants to walk like Christ in the world. You get it. That should not be new. Now, those are just three realities. Obedience proves salvation. You know that. That makes the opposite also true. Are you ready? Here's point number four. Disobedience proves hypocrisy. Look at verse four. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, if you have any problem with this sermon being direct, take it up with John. Look at what John says. I know, I know. There are people who say, I know him. I'm saved. I've given my life to Christ. I'm a believer. John says, I know, I've seen him. But they don't keep God's commandments. Somebody might walk up to John and say, what do I do about that person? They say they believe in Jesus, but they don't obey. What am I supposed to do? And John says, well, it's real simple. They are lying. They're lying. They're a liar. The truth is not in them. If it was in them, they would obey his commandments. The fact that they don't obey his commandments, yet say they know him, only makes them a liar. Remember this sermon, Matthew seven twenty one, Scariest passage in the Bible. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who what? Does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Can you imagine the horror of that day? When people stand before the Lord with their suitcase in hand, expecting to waltz into the kingdom of heaven, and he says, I don't know who you are. What should should you do? Lord? You know me. Remember it goes on to say, I preached in your name. I cast out demons. I worked many miracles. And he'll say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know you. Why? You didn't do the will of the Father. There's no obedience in you. Titus 1.16. It can't get any clearer than this. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. Being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. It's not their words that prove their salvation is phony. It's their works. And we say it, you know and I know, salvation is always by grace alone through faith alone. Do not mix this up. We are not saying that you somehow earn your salvation by obeying God. You won't, you can't, you never will. But we are emphatically saying, if you have been saved, it will produce good works in you. And if those good works do not show up, 
then it is a safe, valid test that salvation never occurred. Nor am I saying you'll never sin again, obviously. But it's never okay with the believer when they do. No believer is like, well, I sinned, who cares? That doesn't happen. I sin daily. I, I, there's sin I commit, and I'm not even immediately aware of it. I'm, I'm sure of that. If God were to expose every aspect of my wickedness to me at one point in my heart, it would probably blow my mind and stop my heart to see how far short of the holy I am on a daily basis. But this much I do know. When I sin and I know it, I hate it. Don't you? Don't you hate it? Don't you just crush under the load? I mean, how, how fast do you run to your knees? How fast do you run to say, God, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't want to do that. Cleanse me from that. You know it. Why? Because the heartbeat of a believer is to obey God. And when they don't obey, it grieves them. It pulls back all the old tastes of the old life which they were saved from. Obedience proves salvation. Disobedience proves hypocrisy. Salvation is not real. Now, all of that is the premise to get to the fifth point. This is what we've been driving at. Therefore, we would say, number five, obedience produces assurance. Look at verse three. First four words. By this we what? We know. You see it in verse 5 again, second sentence. By this we know. John doesn't say you can use this criteria to point you in the right direction. He doesn't say you can use this criteria to, you know, think that odds are probably good. He says, do you want to know that you have come to know Christ? Do you want to know that you are in Christ? It does not happen mystically. If you're waiting on a vision from heaven or a hand to write on a wall and put a check mark there or some sort of you know, euphoric feeling or esoteric experience to validate the fact that you're saved, that is not how salvation is validated. And even if you get it, I wouldn't trust it. That is not how God has deemed he will let you know you're saved. Salvation and assurance is also not gained emotionally. Well, I felt saved. I used to go through evangelism training. You probably have been through this too. It was real big in the 80s. One of them I went through in particular, after you led this person to, quote, pray this sinner's prayer, it trained you to very next question say, after they, quote, prayed the prayer, to say, how do you feel? Anybody remember that training? Now, how do you feel? I, this is not all you'll like this. There was a VBS, and I was probably 16, 17, 18. was not saved yet, but like I told you, I knew how to play church. And so... This boy who had been the, you know, every VBS has that one spawn of Satan, right? That just wants to destroy all VBS. We've all had that to test our, look, you can wag your head at me, but you know it's true. They've all had one and you've thought it too. This kid's name happened to be Jesus, oddly enough. And so he comes to, he comes to VBS and I mean, he's the kid that you're trying to keep him from wrecking the kitchen, from drinking the drain all, from beating up the other kid. I mean, it's just, it's awful. Well, sure enough, last service, Jesus walks forward, and he wants to be saved. And the preacher asked me if I'll go talk to Jesus. Well, that's kind of comical because, as I told you, I was not saved, and, like, I would know any idea of what it meant to be saved. But I had my little pamphlet of what you're supposed to do. And so, you know, I asked Jesus all about this decision he's making, and after he prays the prayer, I ask him, how do you feel? His answer, I feel Jesus taking over my body. Is that what it feels like? When you're saved, do you feel Jesus taking over your body? Do you feel warm and tingly? Do you feel a sense of weightlessness? What does it feel like? Not a clue. Because it's not measured by your feeling. It's not measured emotionally. It's measured practically. Those who have come to Christ live different. They obey Christ. I'm going to... Use John for an example for a minute. I love this. I mean, I love this. You've all read Luke 15. Luke 15 is that famous chapter in Luke's gospel about the three lost things, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son, remember? And the whole point of Luke 15 is to address the Pharisees who did not want the hairy unwashed to be saved. And so Jesus said, remember this famous statement at the beginning of the chapter, I tell you, there is more joy in heaven 
over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Remember? And that was Jesus' point. That heaven rejoices when a sinner is saved. Now, I've heard that chapter applied so many times in my life. I've been at youth rallies. I've been at camps. I've been in evangelistic events. I've been at evangelism conferences. I've been all over the place. And in these events where someone will get up and preach and then you see this massive horde of people, you know, start coming out of the aisles and walking down. I remember the first time I ever saw there was a Dawson McAllister when I was in junior high. Man, gobs of these junior high kids come flying out of the stands, just funneling down to the front. And inevitably, someone at that situation will get up and say, don't you just rejoice? The Bible says heaven rejoices over a sinner that repents. Don't you just rejoice in what you've seen take place here? I'm going to tell you honest. No, I do not. Never. I used to try to pretend like I did because it felt like I was supposed to. I never rejoice over decisions made in an invitation. I mean, it's not that I'm opposed to it, but you're asking me, do I rejoice when I see someone walk an aisle? And the answer is no. Do I rejoice when I hear someone pray the sinner's prayer? And the answer is no. And somebody will say, well, how can you say that? Heaven rejoices. Heaven knows their heart. I don't. You want to know when I rejoice? 3 John, verse 4. Here's what John said. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children, what? Walking in the truth. John said, I don't rejoice when they walk an aisle. I don't rejoice when they say they believe. I rejoice when they overcome temptation. I rejoice when they sacrifice themselves for the good of their neighbor. I rejoice when they obey the command of God that puts them in danger even when they obey it. I rejoice when they go forward, when the rest of the world goes backward. I rejoice when they're a light in the midst of darkness. I rejoice when they're a salt in a tasteless world. I rejoice when they choose righteousness and holiness over the temptation of their culture. That's when I rejoice. Why? Because that's when I know they've been saved. I I, I don't know. I can't read a heart. I have no crystal ball. Even if you walk this morning and say, I want to be saved, I'm glad. I mean, certainly that starts there. But if you're asking, am I doing backflips internally? No. But in a month or so, I might be. When I see that you are not the same person you used to be, when I see that you are different, oh yeah, then I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to rejoice in your salvation. But this is the point that John is making. It is obedience that proves salvation occurs. So here you go, church. Do you want to know that you're saved? I I mean, I certainly want to know. Do you want to know that you know that you're a child of God? That if you died today, you're headed to heaven? That, That if everything fell apart in America and we all ended up being killed, would you like to know that at your death you will stand in the presence of God redeemed, forgiven, and that there is no doubt whatsoever that you are any longer under the wrath of God and headed to hell. Would you like to know that? To say, I don't, want to, I don't ever worry about my salvation again. You want assurance? You can. You know where you find it? In obedience. That's all I have to ask you. It's a real simple question. Has God so transformed your heart as to make obedience the heartbeat of your life? And you, as you test yourself... And examine yourself. I'm not asking you to you perfectly obey all the time. I understand the need for confession and repentance and coming back to the Lord. But what I'm asking you is, has that transformed to be the desire of your heart? I mean, you know when you woke up this morning, did you desire to obey God or not? You know this week that you just lived, whether or not you even gave obedience to God a second thought. You know since the time you, quote, prayed the prayer and were baptized, if anything changed in your life. And so I'm going to ask you, did it? Do you obey the Lord? Is that your heartbeat? Is that your desire? Is that what you want? If so, you're saved. And you can know it. Because that is not the attitude of lost people. Now if you say, no, that, that's not me. I live in fear. I don't know if I'm saved. I don't have assurance. And if I run that test, I've got to tell you, no, that's not me. Because quite honestly, I haven't given obedience a second thought. God's commands are burdensome to me. I don't really want to do them. I don't even think about obeying it. It really hasn't ever changed in my life. I'm the same person I ever was. Look, I'm not trying to be cruel. I think it's important to know that you're not saved. 
And you can be. That's, that's the good news. You can be. He'll forgive you and save you today. He'll transform you and change you today. When you come and repent of your sin and cry out to him. We read this verse about being in him. You want to know if you're in him? I love that. You know that. I love the in him reality. I'm going to stand before God and God's going to judge me as though I were Jesus. I'm not Jesus, but that's how he's going to judge me because I am in him. I'm wrapped in his righteousness. And friend, he'll wrap you in his righteousness too. When you say, I am not righteous, I am not pleasing, I am not acceptable, I make a mess of this and I do my own thing all the time. But I want to be, I want to be wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus. I want to be forgiven. I want to be justified. He'll do it. The Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I've never heard a testimony of anybody who said, I asked him to be saved and he said no. He doesn't do it. He's merciful. He's gracious. And he will save you too. But don't go through this life with false assurance. Do not leave this life with false assurance. And if you are a believer, don't live another second without blessed assurance. That's what allows you to be obedient. That's what allows you to face danger. That's what allows you to go forward to know whatever this world may do, whatever the enemy may have planned, it does not matter because I know where I'm headed. Man, the freedom that comes with the assurance of knowing. And it's all wrapped up in your obedient life, the heart that God's transformed. Let's pray. Father, we come to you because you are our God. And God, we thank you that you are not like us. We would never give somebody assurance. That's how we'd control them and manipulate them, make them toe the line. But you and your grace and mercy have seen fit not only to save us, but to make sure that we know it when we're saved so that we can enjoy this life, so that we can enjoy our salvation, so that we can enjoy the freedom and rest and peace of knowing that whatever we may face, someday we will spend eternity with you. That is blessed assurance. Thank you so much for that. And God, it's my prayer that every true believer who hears this will immediately have that assurance that your spirit who testifies with our spirits that we are children of God would immediately testify with your children to let them know you are mine you are saved you are secure and I pray the flip side as well for those that are not yours those that have not been saved that you would remove every shred of assurance they experience not because we want them to feel miserable, but because we long for the sorrow that leads to repentance. We long, God, for them to be saved. And so we pray, God, that for them there would be conviction, clarity, enlightenment. That they would see where they stand before you. That they might repent of their sin and be saved. This is the most gracious act you give. And we ask this, God. We ask you to do all these things for your glory that you may be praised. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.